All right, so you should have received update number 908. And the editorial this time was written by me with the title, Be Alert and Go On Without Fear. Now this editorial also has been already translated into German and has been posted on the German website last night. I don't want to take much time to go into it, just putting some highlights in front of you. I said in here that in my last editorial, dated November 15, I mentioned that some members of the Church of God lose heart and walk away, thereby forgetting Christ's admonition to hold fast what they have so that they don't lose their crown, referring to Revelation 3 and verse 11. Of course, it's not only because we lose heart that we might walk away. It can also be due to Satan's influence, Satan's attempts to give us doubts, give us other reasons, justifications to turn our back on God, on God's church, whatever the reason might be, you walk away, you become like the vine which withers. That's just the way it is. I don't care what the justification is, I don't care what the rationale may be, you will be on your own. We also say in this editorial that we must work on being ready today spiritually while planning to have an entire life before us physically. It's a fine balance, it's a delicate balance. Of course, you have to have the priorities straight, but you cannot say, oh, because I know that the Great Tribulation is going to start, fill in the blank, therefore I don't have to do anything anymore. You know, that would be a foolish idea. No, you are responsible to take care of your physical belongings, your physical responsibilities, but at the same time, being ready spiritually. Because even tonight, it could be your last waking moment. You could die. And when you wake up, within the next second of your consciousness, if you are a converted Christian, you will stand in front of Jesus Christ, having to give account for what you have done. So we all have to be prepared spiritually at all times. At the same time, we should take care of our physical responsibilities. When it comes to the current events, as you know, we are taking many of those articles now which we publish in English, translating those into German, and then posting those on our German website, which we have already done last night. And those of the German brethren who might be listening in, I want to thank them who are so much involved in helping us in this regard. We have several translators, and we are spreading this somewhat, so this person does that kind of a translation for that kind of an article. And so this one here was done by Mr. Popescu. The editorial actually was translated by Robert Moore. And I want to quickly go through some of the highlights without quoting the articles themselves, except for a few exceptions. I want to just point out what we have been saying in our comments. There is one where we say that President Trump has said in an interview with Fox News that he would be fine with withdrawing U.S. troops from Iraq. But Iraq would have to pay them a lot of money for the U.S. services so far. And as we have been saying all along, the time will come when the United States will withdraw from not just Iraq, but from the Middle East. And then another power will come in to fill the void. When it comes to the quote-unquote admission by Iran that they in fact have shot down the Ukrainian airline. We say that actually it has been confirmed now what has already been reported earlier, and that is that Iran shot down the Ukrainian airline with two missiles, not just one, but two, showing very clearly this was an accident. This was carefully planned and staged. We also talk about this very cozy meeting between Angela Merkel and Vladimir Putin. And it was interesting that they were all in agreement to be in disagreement with the United States. The Build Online tabloid wrote in an editorial that Angela Merkel has become a weak chancellor. And then they say, where is a chancellor whom we once knew? She accepts every cynical provocation 
from Putin. Europe is in desperate need of an adversary equal to Putin. Let me repeat this. Europe is in desperate need of an adversary equal to Putin. Angela Merkel has not been that for a long time. So Europe is waiting. We are waiting to see when the person called the beast in the Bible is going to arise and manifest himself. And when we see that happening, we know the time is very short. An article by Politico, Politico dated January 8, was titled, Europe hates Trump more than Iran. Now think of that headline. Europe hates Trump more than Iran. And then Politico wrote in the article, whenever you look, there is complete disagreement between the states, United States, and Europe. The European's response has focused on trying to placate Iran instead of displaying solidarity with the United States. Europe's refusal to stand by America's side on Iran has not gone unnoticed in Washington. As we have said, the relationship between the United States of America and Europe is going to deteriorate in such a drastic and speedy manner that many things might happen this year. And of course, that won't be good for nobody involved. But they have to happen because we know these things have to occur so that Jesus Christ can come back. Another article by Politico dated January 8 asks the question, what is Europe going to do? What can Europe do when it comes to the Middle East? And they wrote, given Baghdad's dire need for support to prevent its or to prevent the rebirth of the Islamic State, this could open a space for a European military mission as well. Given its commitment to the fight against the Islamic State, it would be in a privileged position to fill what otherwise risks becoming a dangerous void. So very clearly, the power which is going to intervene in the Middle East when America withdraws it's not China, it's not Russia, it's not a unity of Arab nations, no, it's Europe. As we have been saying for I don't know how many years, decades, almost like centuries, it's what's going to happen. The Bible makes this very, very clear. Another article by Deutsche Welle pointed out that in the case of a nuclear strike, German tornado fighter jets and their crews would deliver the American bombs. See, most people have no idea that America has stored its nuclear bombs in Germany. And the locations are pretty much kept in secret, but one location is Büchel in Germany, and they say there the estimates range between 10 to 20 American nuclear weapons in Germany. And the new Standing Watch program goes more into that and what it may mean from a prophetic standpoint. I found this article quite interesting, which was published by the Times of Israel, dated, dated January 10. I'd like to read it to you. It's a short article. But it shows you in what kind of a world we are living. The education minister of Israel, Rafi Peretz, came under fire Friday for an interview where he appeared to call same-sex marriage unnatural. Can you believe this? He calls them unnatural. In the religious public that lives according to the Torah, a normal family is a man and a woman, he said in an interview. We don't need to, to be ashamed that we live in this natural way, he said. And then he was asked how he would respond if one of his children was gay. That was his answer. Thank God my kids grew up naturally and healthy. They are building their families from Jewish values, he said. You can imagine the furor, the reaction, including by gay members of the Knesset over there. And here is one by Labour MK Itzik Shmuli, that's his name, and that's what he says. And he says, look, this Rabbi Rafi Peretz 
This is what a natural and healthy family looks like, he said in a tweet that included a photo of him with his partner and his son. So that's a natural family. And this is going on in Israel. Of course, it's going on all over the world. When it comes to our economic situation, and when I say our, I mean the economic situation of the entire world, we published an article by CNN, dated January 13, saying this. The world's already huge debt load smashed the record for the highest debt to GDP ratio before 2019 was even over. In fact, it broke that record in the first nine months of last year. Global debt, which comprises borrowings from households, governments, and companies, grew by $9 trillion to nearly $253 trillion in the first nine months of the year. The estimate is that in 2020, the global debt will exceed $257 trillion in the first quarter of 2020. I mean, these are figures you can't even possibly imagine. But what does it mean? Well, first of all, who are the big villains in this fiasco? The developed markets, it says, such as the United States of America and Europe. They are the worst perpetrators. And the article also says that such massive worldwide debt is a real risk for the global economy. And it also talks about the refinancing risk is massive. So if we think that we are living happily ever after in great economic prosperity, think again. I mean, it's a bubble which is going to burst. The world cannot carry that enormous debt much longer. There's no way. There is no way that it can happen. When it comes to the situation with the two popes, I'm coming back to that in a moment. But I also like to point out another article about earthquakes and volcanoes. And this talks about the volcano in Alaska, which blew up, the volcano in Mexico, which blew up, the volcano in South America, which blew up, the volcano in the Philippines, which blew up, and then, of course, the ongoing earthquakes in Puerto Rico. All of this in 2020. All of this is in those few days since 2020 began. Also, we got an update by Mr. Paul Niehoff, and it comes to Australia. In this context, it's quite relevant. He says, over here in Melbourne, for one morning, we had the poorest air quality in comparison with all major cities of the world. The smoke was coming from over 100 miles away. The weather changed from extreme heat to flooding and severe winds in a few hours. And then he talks about our members. Sandy and Bruce have been home a few times to water their plants and do washing, but are planning to return home permanently next Wednesday. The smoke has been bad at their property, but the fire warnings and fires never reached it. Now listen to this. The warning areas were to the northeast, the southwest, and the southeast of their home, even though they live in thick bushlands. Can God protect his people? You better believe he can. And then it says that at the town of Bright, where we observed the feast last year, there is an advice warning, but only in, in evacuation for tourists, not for the residents. And of course, the hope is that they can keep the feast there this year as well. Now, The Guardian added the following on January 17. Hundreds of thousands of fish dead in North South Wales, or NSW, it's not North South Wales, it's in Australia somewhere, right? As Bushfire air washed into river. Ecologist fears the Macley River may take decades to recover, with heavy rains likely to affect other waterways. Hundreds of thousands of fish 
in addition to perhaps a million of animals which also died in the fire. Now, before I go into the Q&A and the rest of the work section, I'd like to talk a little bit about the two popes. I'm not talking about the movie, The Two Popes. I'm talking about Pope Benedict and Pope Franciscus. Now, BBC News reported on January 13 that retired Pope Benedict XVI, he was the former Cardinal Ratzinger, very well known under that name too, it says that he has issued a defense of priestly celibacy in the Catholic Church as his successor, Francis, considers easing a ban on married men serving as priests. Pope Benedict made the appeal in a book co-authored with Cardinal Robert Sarah. And this has caused all kinds of stir, because now people are asking the question, who is really in charge in the Catholic Church? Is it Benedict? Is it Francis? Is there a competition going on between the two? The Los Angeles Times wrote on January 13, Benedict's intervention was extraordinary. Given he had promised to remain hidden from the world when he retired in 2013 and pledged his obedience to the new pope. The implications of such an intervention are grave. Given that conservative and traditionalist Catholics nostalgic for Benedict's orthodoxy, they're already deeply opposed to Francis, with some even considering Benedict's resignation illegitimate. And then the Guardian added on January 13, there is a real worry that the figure of the former Pope, Benedict, who has a big following among those from more conservative circles, could prevent Francis from making a decision that he felt right for the church. And then the Vatican, and apparently even Benedict through his spokesman, even though that's a little bit unclear, they tried to do some damage control. And so the AFP wrote on January 14 that the ex-pontiff's private secretary, Georg Genswein, clarified that although Benedict had given Sarah passages he had written to use as a cardinal saw fit, he had not approved any plans for a double signature book, nor had he seen and authorized the cover. It was just a misunderstanding, he said. But Cardinal Sarah took to Twitter on Tuesday to defend himself, saying Benedict knew the collaboration would be a book, and they had sent proofs back and forth for corrections. And then the Catholic Daily Lacroix reported a flurry of exchanges Monday between Benedict's abode and Francis, quote, with the danger of a book that erects the Pope emeritus as a parallel magisterium, in other words, Catholic authority, was clearly understood. The Associated Press wrote on January 14, the book's English language publisher, Ignatius Press, refused to back down, saying the book would carry Benedict's name as the co-author. The article also said that some noted that the lines in Benedict's case were particularly blurred because of Genswein's dual role. Now listen to this. He is both Benedict's private secretary and the prefect of Francis' papal household. So it's clear that damage control is backfiring. Nobody really believes those explanations. And it is interesting that Benedict, even though he's old, still plays a role, may still play a role. In light of this, let me read to you what we published in our update 861, dated January 25, 2019. It's about a year ago, just about a year ago. And later we used that article, and it's part of our new booklet on how do we know that Christ's return is near. But this is what we wrote. When focusing on the false prophets, we learn that he will be possessed by a powerful demon, Revelation 16, verse 13. Since there is a close association between the false prophet and the woman, 
referring to the woman in Revelation 17, we conclude that he will be a pope. Even though we are not told in the Bible that he will be black, or that his name will be Peter, or that he will only have one eye. These are concepts which are not contained in scripture. Rather, they are prophecies, quote unquote, from, quest from questionable and, in all likelihood, demonic sources. You might have heard about these, quote unquote, ideas too. The last pope has to be black and he is going to be uh, one-eyed and only has, uh, his name will be Peter. I mean, there's nothing in the Bible referring to that at all. But we go on to say, it is not entirely clear whether the false prophet will be the particular pope who will be elected by the majority of the Catholic cardinals to be in power at the time of the manifestation of the beast. There is much conflict going on in the Roman Catholic Church today between the pope and the Vatican and between bishops and cardinals belonging to conservative and liberal factions as has been the case many times in previous decades and centuries, and now we might add, and also between the old and the new pope. We go on to say it might therefore be conceivable that a strong competitor to the duly elected pope within the Catholic Church might arise, claiming the title and office of pope and performing satanic miracles. What we do know for certain is that the false prophet will belong to the religious Babylonian system. He will not arise from Islam or other non-Christian religions. The Bible does not tell us the ancestry of the false prophet, but we are clearly told that the beast will be of Assyrian descent, i.e. German or Austrian. Nothing is mentioned regarding the false prophet. What we need to watch for is a mighty religious quote-unquote Christian figure who will begin to perform quote-unquote miracles, working together with a charismatic political leader, the beast, and ultimately moving to Jerusalem at the time when the third temple is being built or completed. So I wanted to bring this back to your attention because interesting things are developing right now in the Catholic Church. And I was asked, do you believe that Francis is the false prophet? And my answer is, Let's wait and see. Let's wait and see. That's why we're supposed to watch. The Q&A this week is the third part and final part of the question how God can listen to billions of prayers at the same time. And we say in there that it may be easier for man's mind to grasp the fact that God can and does listen to multiple prayers at the same time and that he acts on them at the same time when we realize that God is just more is that God is just not one being, but a family, consisting of two God beings, the Father and the Son. And then we talk about the context, concept of what it means to pray in the name of Christ. And we take this from our free booklet on Teach Us to Pray. And then we say this. There is communication going on between the Father and Christ. Both are involved when it comes to listening to and answering the prayers of God's people. Now, this concept might help us to also understand better what will occur when billions of people will be resurrected in the great white throne judgment, who will all be praying to God at the same time. But then, the God family will consist of millions of beings who will all be God, all being able and willing to hear and respond to those who pray. And then we talk about the role of angels. We should also not forget those. And the question we ask then is, well, what anything do angels have to do with human prayers? And then we quote two interesting passages in the book of Revelation. And then we talk about guardian angels. Now, we should not forget those because guardian angels do exist. And people are sometimes protected without knowing how and why that is happening. But they are guardian angels. And we should never dismiss that. And as I've said so many times before, there might be angels, many angels, in this room right now. And hopefully they're not being disturbed by our little kids because they want to hear what's being said. Imagine that concept. They want to hear what we are saying today. 
He concludes this Q&A with the following statements. It's not a problem for the God family to listen to and answer many prayers at the same time. We should never think that God is too busy to hear us. Rather, we might sometimes think that we are too busy to pray to him. But without him and his help, where would we be? And more importantly, what would we be? Most certainly not what we are today or what we can become. A spirit begotten child of his, in whom the Father and the Son's Holy Spirit dwells. So it's not a problem for God to listen to you. Sometimes it's a problem for us to talk to him. And so this now pretty much concludes the announcement, except for one thing. I'd like to read one highlight from the member letter saying this, and this is, of course, Kian Mitchell writing, I think that as the end draws to a close, the effort which Satan is using to discourage and get us to want to give up is becoming stronger with more frequency. The only way to combat this type of mindset and these feelings is to draw closer to God. The only way we are going to be able to face the coming days, weeks, months, and years is to make sure we are putting God first and foremost in our life. Nothing else is going to matter. Amen to that.